going to be treading water, uh, or is there a real possibility for system change? And if so, you know, what are we going to be doing, and how are we going to be orienting our efforts and our activism to actually uh, achieving system uh, change? So. Um, I'm, I'm really excited because we're going to have three very diverse perspectives, uh, starting with Esteban Kelly, uh, who's the executive director of the U.S. Federation for Worker Cooperatives. Is that? Okay, good. Uh, and uh, Julie Matai, a, a distinguished professor of uh, economics uh, at, um, how do I pronounce it? Wellesley. Wesley. Wellesley. Wellesley. Uh, sorry, yeah. Wellesley College. Uh, Wellesley College? Okay, good. And Gar Alperwitz, who's the co-founder of the Next System uh, Project and uh, founder of the Democracy Collaborative. So uh, we're going to start in that order, um, and then we're going to have a little bit of discussion after their brief uh, presentations uh, between the panelists, uh, which I will moderate. And then we're going to open it up to a lot of the questions that, that you all will be thinking about. But I'm interested in this conversation particularly because each of them are bringing uh, a really uh, critical kind of dimension, whether it be feminist economics or cooperativism or, you know, the long-term kind of uh, history behind system change uh, to this dialogue. So I'm expecting a very rich conversation with all of you. Uh, so without further, further ado, uh, Esteban Kelly. Thanks. So, I, are we really on the same page? Did you want to, s I thought you were gonna say like another thing about the questions we're really considering today. Did you want to help us with that? Yeah, I think so. I think so, because I'm gonna jump into my answer and I don't feel like you've posed the question. <laughs> Although you did pretty well without notes, I gotta say. The intro, you like nailed it. Okay, good. Yeah. Uh, all right, so I'm back on the spot, uh, thanks to Esteban here. And, um, you know, the, the, the question of system change is, let me just uh, flesh that out a little bit uh, from what I, what I said initially. Um, right now, uh, a lot of the considerations that we're dealing with is uh, especially for communities of color, frontline communities, and, you know, uh, you know the U.S. Uh, working class writ large is a question of survival. And can the system of, you know, U.S. Uh, corporate capitalism uh, create the kinds of concessions that once kind of marked the uh, system uh, at a time where productivity was uh, largely redistributed uh, on much more egalitarian terms uh, with the general population, um, whether we can kind of reform the institutional structures so that you can have a government that takes, for example, antitrust more seriously and the kind of tendency for big corporations to kind of form together. Um, those are the kinds of uh, 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 questions that are typically at the forefront of the political debate right now. Um, and the question of an alternative to the system, beyond reforms, but an actual system change, is not yet on the map on a national level with the sufficient kind of uh, uh, detail and prescriptive kinds of elements that uh, I would like to see. I think that the space is beginning to open up and people are becoming more and more receptive to alternative systemic kinds of uh, 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 discussion. And so, for example, there have now been tens of millions of, of voters who, for whom the, the term democratic socialism has resonated. But does that mean anything more than, uh, you know, uh, checking accounts at post offices? Does it mean anything more than a higher minimum wage? Uh, what is the actual content of something like democratic socialism? Can we create an alternative systemic arrangement in our economy, in our politics, that actually leads to the outcomes that we would like to see rather than restraining the uh, kinds of elements that we're trying to combat? So, uh, was that a, a decent? Okay, good. Also without notes, so. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Keen. Um, and in some ways, that was in fairness to, that was out of fair, that was unfair for him, but that was in fairness to you all, um, because this is a conversation, this is a continuation of a conversation that we've been having, um, and, and so it, 
you're kind of jumping in midstream, and it'll be exciting to see where it goes. Uh, most recently, Gar and I uh, had the chance to discuss this um, at a plenary for the North American Social Solidarity Economy, which was convened in Detroit um, just a few months ago. And Julie and I were founding uh, board members for the US Solidarity Economy Network um, and, uh, and have been having those kinds of conversations in that context. So in addition to, uh, to heading up the US Federation of Worker Co-ops, um, I do bring, um, I do want to approach these questions from a very internationalist perspective, um, understanding that we stand in the very humble position of being the most underdeveloped, the least developed um, solidarity economy region uh, on the planet. I would say even Antarctica has a stronger solidarity economy. <laughs> Have you watched any of those doc documentaries on Netflix? Um, it's an example, it's, they're like really in it. It's basically communism. It's also the only continent that's completely run by consensus um, by a scientific community. That's actually true. Um, so <laughs> so I, I, it's, it's incumbent upon us to, to begin not by thinking about our own backyards or Washington DC, but to really shift it to the global context because we have so much to learn uh, from the progress elsewhere. Um, and and what can we what can we start to um, to weave into the power that we have around the movements for social racial, racial and e economic justice um, here in the U.S. and I think that that's something that's also different. Um, I forgot to include a slide about Mondragon. Do you mind clicking the next slide? I forgot to include a slide about Mondragon. Um, but uh, how many of you are familiar with the worker cooperatives in Mondragon, Spain? So most of you. Cool. Um, so I had a chance to go there just this past May, and it was fascinating, and I'm not gonna unpack that whole trip, but one of the things that, um, that I left realizing was that it, Mondragon is less of a model for us to try to replicate, and more of just a proof of concept, that, that, that the, the idea of workplace democracy, worker ownership, worker co-ops, um, can scale, right? So Mondragon is, what is it, the eighth largest corporation in Spain, um, it was one of the only uh, companies and regions that, that actually continued to expand and, and, and hire people that had the lowest rate of underemployment during the recession in Europe uh, most recently, right? So this, this is something that is, um, that's, that's an important m marker of, of how we endure and survive um, in late hypercapitalism um, using the model of worker co-ops. But most importantly, and also most exceptionally, um, and least replicably is the fact that they're really businesses that are focused on heavy industry and manufacturing. And that's different from almost all of the other worker co-ops um, in the world. So most of the worker-owned businesses are in the um, service and artisan industries, whatever that means. I mean, that's, that could be a lot of things from driving taxis to food systems to IT, um, catering, all different kinds, solar panel installations, is kind of getting more, less into services and more into the light industry. So we do have some light industry all around the world, um, but really Mondragon is, is exceptional in that sense. And, um, and they built that up in the context of a fascist regime. <laughs> so most of us aren't living yet under a fascist regime um, with us fairly isolationist policies, but also a, a certain context of mid-century capitalism where they were trying to build up the economy in Spain. The other thing that Father Arismendi Arrieta did, uh, who was the, the founder of the Mondragon Co-ops um, in Spain, is um, he, as an assistant priest, he was insulated from the sort of long arm of, of Franco's dictatorship because he was tied to the Catholic Church. And Franco didn't want to mess with the Catholic Church and set off a whole chain of events of, of interventionism. Um, there was sort of a, a, a stalemate. And so he sort of let anyone affiliated with the Catholic Church more or less do what they were going to do as long as it wasn't a direct confrontation with what he was doing. Um, and so they had this opportunity to not only experiment and innovate and do these weird things, starting up cooperatives and schools and community projects, um, but uh, Father Arismendi Arrieta also had basically a monopoly on anyone interested in doing the kind of work that you all do. So anyone who normally would go into nonprofits, community organizing, certainly cooperatives, um, different kinds of social political work, political organizing, uh, whether that was like liberal or far radical or progressive or anything, um, you weren't allowed to do any of that. And so 
by getting involved, the, the, the cooperatives that, that they were starting there in Mondragon were kind of your only option. So they had a monopoly on talent of anyone interested in a broad spectrum of anyone interested in doing this kind of stuff. That's how they were able to plug in. Um, so actually, next slide. Can you bring me the next slide? Where are we? All right, so I want to introduce this concept of emergence, um, an emergent strategy. This is something that is in starting to inform my thinking when we think really big and large and systemic. It's not how do you grapple with and contend with the existing system, right? What's the Buckminster Fuller uh, quote? It's about in order to, um, to change a current paradigm, you don't struggle with it. You sort of organize another thing that will eventually, eventually will displace it. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about displacing capitalism. Um, there, there is work in resisting and confronting, and there's, a lot of, there's been a lot of um, uh, workshops and conversations this weekend that, that go through that in deep detail, and I think that this work needs to be rooted in solidarity with those movements to remain and exist and resist and be resilient, of course, right? And that's for on behalf of the planet and also people, right, who are under the thumb of uh, extractive capitalism. Um, but for those of us who are doing this new, this other work, there aren't a lot of us. And so it, it is important to focus our, our energy and attention and our thinking uh, on what that looks like. So the concept of emergence comes from, go back, um, comes from science fiction um, and uh, this actually was put together, these illustrations are from Rachel Plattis, who's running around the event this weekend and um, was on the staff of NEC for a long time. Um, but the concepts were sort of uh, pulled together by a great thinker um, and contemporary and friend who lives in Detroit uh, named Adrienne Marie Brown. And uh, she spoke at the last Common Bound and, and introduced us to these ideas. Um, so emergence is the way complex systems and patterns, so we're already dealing with this idea of complexity, Complex, you know, our conversation today is around the complexity, as Keen sort of introduced, of uh, global planetary capitalism, this, this hugely complex economic system, the most complex, the most vast sweeping um, economic system that's existed in our uh, galaxy, far as we know. Um, so emergence is the way <laughs> complex systems and patterns arise out of multiplicity and relatively simple interactions. And there's a lot of different things that it emphasizes, including relationships, um, authenticity, listening, critical connections. Um, and so I wanna, um, actually, can you bring us to the next slide? Um, so I wanna introduce these seven core principles and how they can inform our thinking, our organizing, and our philosophy at a certain point. It's about how do we envision is a philosophical question. The fact that it's critical and that it matters and that it has real world implications doesn't detract from the fact that it is, um, it is, it is uh, a bit of a mental exercise. So um, the first is that it's intentional. Um, the second is that it's resilient because it's decentralized. So part of what they were able to do in Mondragon, Spain was um, be resilient in the face of uh, an economic crisis. In fact, that economic crisis brought down the oldest, largest, and most successful until that date of the Mondragon cooperatives, which was Fagor. They made um, home stove and kitchen appliance kind of things, right? Like uh, white goods, refrigerators, uh, uh, dishwashers, that kind of thing. And um, surplus capital from England and other parts of Europe, was going into this big housing boom in Spain. People were buying second homes, summer homes. The climate's a little better there. I don't know if you've been to the UK, but Spain is it's a little better. Um, and so in the housing boom that was happening there, they were building all these homes and then furnishing them with all these white goods. I mean, you needed everything. You're building out the whole kitchen. So it's everything from the stove um, to the dishwasher to washing machines and all of that stuff. Um, when the, that bubble imploded, that business um, almost went bankrupt. And so their first tactic was the other cooperatives bailed them out. They didn't go to the public, they didn't go to banks, they didn't go to anyone else. So that's one lesson in interdependence and decentrality. It wasn't one giant corporation that then was weak and then came down during that moment. Um, so after the third time that they tried bailing them out, they finally said, everyone else said, look you guys, we gotta face the music. This, house, this industry is not gonna pick up anytime soon. I think we need to let this business die after whatever it was, 40, 50 years. So they did, but they have, rather than policies around unemployment, they have policies around, um, what do they call it? 
something like fuller employment or gainful employment. So instead of paying into a fund where it's like, here's a wage while you go find another job, they say they have a whole HR department where it's like, it's our job to find you another job and work. And first we, we look for a place for you to work um, internal, so with another cooperative. Um, so that's one way that the business can die, but because it's a people-centered economy, we can still take care of people and their families and all the benefits that come along with um, the wages and, and the, the living. Um, so that's one example of being decentralized and being resilient as a result of that. There's countless examples. Um, it's adaptive, which is something that maybe we'll get into more in the discussion um, later on. Um, but really, really critical, this concept of how do we build a culture of adaptivity? How do we build institutions that are adaptive? And how, as we're designing movements, um, how are they adaptive to the times so that they're not just inspired by something that happened you know, in the civil rights movement um, and then just copying those, those protest tactics? But how, how, are, how are we relevant to what's happening now, to who we are now, to what our economic system is now, to what our resources and talents are now, what technologies are in the ether, right? Um, and constantly shifting. And it's why um, when we look at this and integrating it into organizational planning, it's not called strategic planning, where you linearly lay out your thing and then that's the objective and you do it, um, which comes from military practice, by the way. Um, but emergent strategy, it's like, well, we're gonna set an intention and then we're gonna say, oh my God, we're way better off doing this other thing or partnering or doing it through another means. So adaptivity. Um, fractal. Um, who was talking, Deborah Fries was just talking about this in the last session, this idea that, that at the smallest scale, um, it looks like what our society and eventually our global, new global economy looks like at a planetary scale, right? So at the smallest scale, if you're um, extracting uh, resources from underneath the ground, you're destroying your water system by fracking, you're poisoning it, you're not caring about the, the children who, um, who are gonna be drinking that water and getting lead, you know, all that stuff, then that's, you're, you end up with a sick planet. You end up with the whole system, right? So when we're looking at what do our movements look like, it's not about, well, it's gonna be hierarchical and controlled here because I have a really good idea of how to run things in West Philly, but someday we'll get to a global, new global system that's interdependent and democratic. No, we need to practice it and iterate it at small scales. And so when we talk about projects, it's not that they're just a one-off and that's why they don't matter. It's, it's that they're sites of experimentation. So the idea here, the way that, that Adrian unpacks it, it's like how the cell um, is a microcosm of the organism. Right? If you're if you're if you're unhealthy at the cellular level, then the then the organism is going to be sick and un, and unhealthy. So fractal, interdependent. Um, that one's pretty obvious. Uses transformative justice. So uh, on Friday night at the panel, they were talking about the co-optation, how the state is so eager to co-opt our our laws and tactics. And so, by the way, is is late corporations in in this moment of neoliberal late capitalism. They're under threat. They're in constant crisis. They've co-opted innovation. They've co-opted disruption as a like 90s anarchist punk. <laughs> it's really eerie to see some of the largest, fastest growing corporations use the aesthetic and language uh, of what we did in the 80s, right? Like the, uh, the 90s, 80s and 90s. So the time of Adbusters is now the Fortune 500 kind of um, culture. So that's really interesting. Um, transformative justice. It's different than restorative justice uh, where you uh, bring the perpetrator of some sort of harm um, and try to restore what the relationship was um, afterwards instead of locking them away, sequestering them, punishing them, right? Transformative justice says all of this happened because of what our world is, is structured like. And um, so I spent about 10 years doing organizing around uh, restorative and transformative justice processes in sexual assault situations. So I got to see this fractal-like experiment with that really up close um, in one of the most challenging kinds of dynamics. And, um, and then we learned that the way that we, if we can at the level, the intimate level of, of our own community and relationships, if we can learn to live with people who've caused that kind of harm, if we can learn to address the context of the different hurt that they've had in their lives, the concept of what does it look like to repair relationships, then we can imagine a future where prisons are abolished, right? Um, just for example. And the last one is create more possibilities. So that's that, that, that solidarity economy principle of pluralism. Okay, next slide. Um, so this is us in, um, I'm, I'm out of the frame, but this was just taken about 10 days ago in Havana, Cuba. Um, and I wanted to invite this concept. I know that Rafael uh, Betancourt talked about this yesterday. Um, he was on our trip, by the way, and spoke with our group. But we were a delegation of Americans 
who are learning about and supporting the transition of the Cuban economy. Um, so I want to introduce this and footnote it. We can talk about it later. But I want to invite in this concept. We talk about the hegemony, the planetary dominance of American capitalism. Um, but it actually isn't everywhere. And that's important if we're thinking really about what is this next system, what's this new world, how do we get there? there it's a small island country uh, that casts a giant shadow, by the way. And they're actually coming about this from, from the exact opposite side. They're also trying to build this just sustainable economy, as Rafael started saying. He kind of stole my thunder. Um, so we're looking at transitioning this one that's got all these free markets and a weird state and all this dispossession and extraction um, and very little community ownership or control, right? Um, and they're looking at one where the state is owning and controlling things, in common, but in a communist system. And actually what they're doing is, they're like, this isn't working anymore. We are trying to intentionally spin off about a third of our economic activity. I'm saying we as if I'm Cuban. I'm not Cuban. Uh, I'm Jamaican, but it doesn't matter. Uh, and instead of spinning it off into private hands to create billionaires or auction off to the largest bidder, as they did in Eastern Europe um, after the Soviet collapse, they're intentionally creating worker-owned cooperatives. So any co-op in Cuba that's not agricultural is a worker co-op. Why? Because if it's a housing co-op, it's just communism. It's owned by the state. If it's you know, any other kind, it's just a, you know, utilities, it's owned by the state. It's just communism, right? So, so there's interesting lessons to be learned there as they're migrating. We're both shifting toward its con convergent evolution. We're moving toward um, this, um, this, this common vision of, uh, of a just, sustainable, community-owned, democratically-controlled economy. Um, they're just doing it much quicker than we are because <laughs> they have different resources. Next slide. Thanks. Um, so in the U.S. context, so this is kind of where we're at by contrast. And, and by the way, they have, since 2014, where they created this experimental law um, around um, spinning off worker co-ops um, within the Cuban economy, they've the government's approved 500 um, petitions for worker co-ops or applications, of which about 300, 350 have already launched and been developed. That's interesting because that's as many co-ops as we have in the United States after 40 years. Um, now, the difference is that there's a quickening, which I'll show you on the next slide. But this is kind of where we're at right now. We've got about 7,000 people in our, our very tiny but very well-organized workforce where we're experimenting with these things. Um, and the median size of them is about 10 people. So we can still get to scale even when the median size is 10 people. And by the way, that's true in Cuba, that's true in Canada as well, median size. Maybe in Canada it might be about 15, but it's similar. Next slide. Um, so growth. Um, of the, whatever, three to 400, 500 worker co-ops that we have in the US, about 60% of them have only formed since 2000. So we're not doing as bad as we thought. It's, it's happening quicker. 31% of them uh, have formed just in the last five or six years. Um, and now we're talking about this, this, this question of a decolonized solidarity economy. So it is owned 60% by people of color who are owning these businesses. That looks really different than the old economy, hey? Um, and about 70% are, are of these businesses are owned by women. 70, but it's not 50, it's not 40, it's not, I mean, that's, that's huge and very significant when we're talking about an economy that has locked women out through informal and, form and feminized labor for so long. So this is pretty significant. Um, I, think, uh, I think I only have one more. I'm just like a closing slide. Oh, uh, yeah, so this is me in Mondragon headquarters. Um, and there's a picture, uh, a little drawing of Father Arzmendi Arieta, the priest who started it all over there. Um, and he says, because this is really a call to, to the future, right? However splendid the present might be, it's destined to fail if it turns its back on the future. So with our context, with our relationships, um, with the things that are good, bad, ugly, everything in between, um, we need to be constantly oriented toward that future. That's future generations. It's not how do we serve ourselves. It's not how do we make this sustainable. It's how do we envision the thing that's sustainable that far, that far outlists us. So um, hopefully those are some seeds for conversation and we'll, uh, we'll dive a little further into it. Thanks so much. Well, oh yeah, I can do that. I'm just moving up here so I can see what the slides are as I talk about them. Okay, so I'm going to talk, can everyone hear me? I'm going to talk about the same question. You can't. Speak, speak closer to the mic. 
Okay. I'm good. Okay. So I'm going to talk about the same question, is economic system change possible? And what I'm going to do is first I'm going to, I don't have 12 minutes, I'm going to first present a framework for understanding the process of economic system change. And then I'm going to use the framework to give some advice on how we can best support and further the process of economic system change. And I'm speaking uh, as a Marxist, feminist, anti-racist, ecological economist who's been in these movements for about 45 years. So I have a bit of experience and always learning. So um, next slide. According to my profession, according to my profession of mainstream economists, um, economic system change is not possible. I'm sure you've, many of you have heard the term coined by Margaret Thatcher. Tina, there is no alternative. Because people are naturally selfish and competitive, they claim, and you've studied this in your, how many of you have taken an economics course? I mean, it's brainwashing. It's nothing other than utter brainwashing in capitalist values and practices. And it's terrible teaching in an econ department all these years. And my, my students come in, and usually they're juniors or seniors, econ majors, and they're just like, wow, it didn't make sense to me when I studied it, but I kept getting more and more of it. And they gradually you know, think like an economist, et cetera. And they're just, when you offer these ideas to them, they're just like, it's like water in a desert. They're so happy to be exposed. And one of the big things we have to do to make economic system change possible is displace mainstream economics. But anyways. They say we need capitalism. Because everyone's so selfish and competitive, we have to have capitalism, an economic system based on greed, inequality, and competition for survival and advancement in order to motivate people to serve the whole. Otherwise, people won't because they're so selfish. So next slide. And this is what they argue also about racism and sexism. We can get rid of those in capitalism. Don't worry. We don't need a new system. We have, and look at the next slide. Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. That's the proof. We have a black person president that we have eliminated racism. If he can do it, anybody can do it. And Hillary's about to do it. And if she doesn't, she still got very close. So literally, that is this argument. And many Americans really get the wool pulled over our eyes by this kind of argument. So next slide. So this is, oh, this one. So this is the response you might have heard from the Zapatistas in Chiapas. Tata. There are thousands of alternatives. Next slide. And this is a response to Tina by Marxist feminist, anti-racist ecological economists like me. Capitalism is rooted in race, gender, and man nature inequality. It was built out of that. It, capitalism created racism in a process of world colonization. It's deeply, deeply embedded in every, every aspect of capitalism, as is uh, patriarchy. So we can't eliminate sexism and racism and the domination of nature within capitalism. They're part of the system. So we need to build a new economic system to eliminate them. Next slide. And we actually are building that new economic system already. And in the solidarity economy movement, we use this iceberg metaphor from the Community Economy Collective to illustrate the emerging new solidarity economy. Below the waterline, invisible to the dominant worldview, are a whole set of practices based on cooperation, sharing, socially responsible consumption, production, and investment. Next slide. And we use also this slide, and I'm sorry it's a little blurry, of Ethan Miller that shows that the solidarity economy exists in every sector of the economy. It's everywhere. And I'm not going to go into the individual practices now, but many workshops, all, almost every workshop at this conference has been looking at these new economic practices. Okay, next slide. And the New Economy Coalition and the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network are doing movement building for the, the emerging new economy. Next. And the Solidarity Economy is emerging worldwide, and groups like REPES, the Intercontinental Movement for the Promotion of the Social Solidarity Economy, is doing this movement building on a global level. Many other groups are doing it, but REPES is the one that's the most focused on solidarity economy construction in the world. We have uh, groups on every continent, and we have now gotten a committee in the UN studying the social solidarity economy. 
We have an ILO uh, Summer Institute on the Solidarity Economy, and it's becoming um, a concept putting it put in certain countries' constitutions and framework legislation. So it's it's a it's a new system concept that is making a lot of progress recently. At the core of this economy is a new solidaristic way of being in the economy and society and a set of emerging new values. So there they are. Deep equality and equality in many different ways. And I have actually defined seven different solidarity processes that fight the inequality paradigm. I'm not gonna go into them now in my short time, but maybe in the discussion later. But the deep equality is on every dimension especially anti-racism, feminism, anti-classism in ecology, but includes many others, like gay and lesbian trans rights, for example. Cooperation, sharing, and social responsibility, economic and political democracy, and freedom and diversity. Next slide. So where is it coming from? It's part of, what I see it is, I'm a historian first and foremost, an economic historian, and we're in the middle of a historic paradigm shift from the inequality paradigm to the solidarity paradigm. And capitalism is actually not full inequality paradigm. That's why we get confused. Capitalism was a system that emerged in rebellion and rejection of aristocratic privilege with the values of equality and democracy, values that it hasn't been able to achieve, but values that it put out to the world. And so, Capitalism is in between the two paradigms and stuck there. We're stuck with our progress. Capitalism is self-destructing. It's time to move on to the next stage on the way to the solidarity paradigm. And capitalism has contradictions, and Marx had this view of internal contradictions. Societies evolve because of internal contradictions. There's just like a seed grows into a plant. Societies have internal contradictions that make them transform qualitatively. And capitalism contradictions include a commitment to efficiency, but it's plagued by unemployment, waste, and ecological destruction. And also, um, didn't I have a second one? Oh yes, a commitment to equality, democracy, and freedom, yet it's plagued by race, gender, and class inequality and domination. So capitalism is full of contradictions. And these contradictions, new slide, have spawned what I call the four great movements, next slide, for the four great social movements against inequality and domination. Feminist movement against gender domination, the civil rights anti-racist movements against race domination, worker anti-classist movement against class domination, and the ecology movement against human nature domination. So these are all in the, what I call the four great movements. And next slide. This is based on a tree driven by a uh, solidarity economy tree drawn by Ethan Miller that the movements, these movements are together and increasingly intertwined are creating the soil that is nurturing the new solidarity economy. So the movements are core. They are the, gro the ground that we grow the solidarity economy in. Next. The growth of the solidarity economy is happening gradually as part of a as part of a larger paradigm shift that is being created by these movements. Think of it as a gradual, deep, paradigmatic, nonviolent, and permanent revolution within market economies from inequality to solidarity. That's what we're in the middle of. Next. And there is on the planet right now a very wide range of economic practices and institutions, and um, Esteban referred to Iceland with, who knew, a consensus community of scientists deciding everything. Um, what I've done with my student this summer, we try to put things on a spectrum from inequality to solidarity, and there's actually quite a bit of difference between countries. We created these indices for anti-racist, where anti-classist is the red, anti-racist, feminist, and ecological, solidarity, and just tried to place countries in it and found quite a bit of difference. And unfortunately, as you probably know, the US was pretty far behind on most of them and last for class. Um, but there is a, a spectrum, and that's something that, if you look at the next slide, Bernie Sanders was pointing this out. A lot of other northern countries, western countries, have more economic human rights than we have. They're qualitatively further advanced in anti-classism than we are. 
And this anti-classism affects women and affects people of color because it makes the economic uh, inequality much less and much less risk. So you can see this progress already happening. Okay. Now, now I'm going to shift because I didn't have a printer when I wrote the second half of this talk. So we're going to go to my advice. This is advice to today's solidarity revolutionaries. Think of yourself as a solidarity revolutionary, one way of thinking of yourself, bringing together that we're fighting all these different inequalities at the same time in a revolutionary, gradual, nonviolent paradigm shift, transformation of economic systems. So the first one, embody the four great social movements in all aspects of your life and your organization or group. Our new institutions are going to break apart if we don't commit to unlearning and opposing racism, sexism, classism, man nature domination, et cetera, in our own practices. Second, we need to have a unity of values and a diversity of visions. The core of the solidarity economy, the core of the new economy is values that are emerging. They've been in pre-capitalist societies, they're emerging now out of contradictions, these values I talked about, equity in all dimensions, sustainability, diversity, solidarity, sharing, compassion, love, these values, they're coming out of people, they're normal to be to healthy human nature, and they're emerging everywhere. So we, the values are core, those are what we share, those are what we argue about when we're, we think you're not really following those values. But we want to allow the diversity of practices, and that was a big problem of the old left. We thought there was one right way. We cannot do that. Next slide. Along with Esteban, I agree, network, network, network. Networks are the nervous system of the emergent solidarity economy. They allow us to build and practice solidarity. They bring us together in self-organizing, in a self-organizing market system. Our market system has a lot of self-organized, a lot of individual impetus. Networking brings us together based on our shared solidarity values. Networking, networks make us visible to one another. They allow us to communicate and work together. They allow us to share money, resources, and knowledge. They provide us with the moral support we need to be different. <clears throat> To be different, speak up, and stand in our power. There's no way I could be the one radical economist at Wellesley for 45 years if I weren't supported by the Union for Radical Political Economics, if I weren't supported by SEND, if I weren't supported by the feminist movement, the anti-race, all these movements that have been supporting me and allowing me to bring something different to my students. Um, they, the networks bring us together en masse when we need to exert the power of numbers, and that's hugely important because we're using the power of numbers against the power of money. And we all know about the power of organized, the power of accumulated money and wealth. Just the Koch brothers, for example. So when you're networking, do not think either or, think both and. And we learn either or thinking in capitalism, both and. You can be in the solidarity economy network, you can be in the new economy network, you can be in the US Federation of Worker Cooperative. Join all the networks you can. Find all the ways you can to connect to people with similar purposes and values to work together and cooperate for change. Our goal is to grow networks of economic solidarity, and this is as important as jobs and GDP growth. It cre it's creating our new system. Next slide. We also want to network at all levels, and this was something that I've seen at different presentations, especially the REPES one yesterday. For example, REPES is the intercontinental network for the promotion of the social solidarity economy. Then we have REPES North America. We have a continental group where we network the US, Canada, and Mexico, and Quebec, which is, thinks of itself as different from, from English-speaking Canada. And then we have the US Solidarity Economy Network and the local networks in Canada. And also, like the New Economy Coalition is a national network of solidarity. So we have different levels, and US Sen is trying to develop more urban and regional networks, because a lot of the solidarity economy work is actually happening in cities, like the Cleveland Project, for example, um, that the Democracy Collaborative is so pushed. So we need to network on all these different levels. And actually, just a little plug, if you're interested 
in joining your group to the U.S. Solidarity Economy Network, please email me, Julie Mathai, jmathai at wellesley.edu, or just Google me and you'll find my email, and I'll get you connected into USN. We have like zero staff. We're a very um, lean organization, and we, um, we base based in volunteer political work, and we'd love to have you join us. Next slide. Practice solidarity with other groups. <clears throat> One way to do this is share your best practices with other groups and organizations. We're taught in capitalism to keep what we know, to keep our special knowledge, to keep our special things so we can compete with others. Solidarity economy is the opposite. So we want to be sharing your best practices. Share the resources. Be vigilant against the inequality paradigm practices of competing against other groups by monopolizing your knowledge and contacts. And this is hard because many of the groups are competing for funding. At the same time, we have to find ways to work together and try to you know, support ourselves without competing. Next slide. OK, one more minute. Practice solidarity across race, class, gender, and species lines. If you have privilege, be an ally to those who don't, and use your privilege to fight their oppression. Unlearn your racism, sexism, classism, and homophobia. This can be done. Even my parents unlearned their homophobia, and my grandmother made a little progress. <laughs> Don't be defensive or get discouraged when you're called out. Be grateful for the learning opportunity. I'm telling, this is serious. You really have to do this. You have to be grateful when people call you out because they're helping you correct yourself and learn. Apologize, reflect, and keep working at it. Remember that we're not immune, even those me as a woman internalizing sexism. We internalize these, these isms, all of us do, even if we're in the press group, so remember that. Next slide. Stand in, but resist co-optation. Besides building alternatives, we need to infiltrate mainstream, mainstream institutions and transform them without losing our moral compasses. This takes courage, fortitude, patience, and continual discernment as to how and when to intervene and when we are on the inside, when we are on the inside. Support yourself with networking on the outside. Another, next slide. Cultivate spirituality. I don't think we talk enough about this, on the left, but the, first, the, the workshop the first night really talked about this. Use meditation, yoga, communing with nature to resource yourself and find inner peace. Connect to spirit through prayer or whatever practice you have. Learn how to calm your mind and listen to your body and emotions. These are crucial. If you're going to be a warrior, which I, I'm going to say in my last slide is be a love warrior. If you're going to be a love warrior, you're going to be taking love and the principle of love and compassion and solidarity out into capitalism and trying to build a new system. You have to be a warrior. You have to be strong. And you have to stay rooted in love. And the basic way to, really helpful way to do that is to have a spiritual practice. Next one. Healing ourselves, healing our economy. Heal yourself. Take care of yourself. We live in an environment that's toxic physically and energetically. Take the time and resources necessary to care for yourself. And then this, my last slide, be a love warrior. Thank you very much. That was great. Thank you, both you guys. Uh, I want to do something um, slightly different from what we've done so far. I'm a historian <clears throat> and a political economist, um, and I kind of change those hats depending upon the day of the week. But um, the first thing I want to say is the last 10 years of development, but particularly the last three, you can see the explosion of activity. Uh, five years ago, the notion that we're actually building something powerful was hard to sell. People didn't believe that. This conference, you can see that there is an extraordinary developmental process, and it's just beginning. I mean, you can project out, at least I would project out, <coughs> a major expansion of what we're doing all over the country and all over the world. <coughs> Excuse me. That's an important thing to grasp, a developmental trend. And it's in the context not only, <coughs> excuse me, not only of a system that is decaying, but critically probably a system that doesn't collapse. And I want to, it doesn't reform and it doesn't collapse. 
It creates pain and disillusionment. Historically, that's a big deal. Lots of people realize something's really wrong. Those housewives in Iowa who said, I'm a democratic socialist, doing it because they know something's really wrong. If it collapses, and I can say a little bit about why I don't think it's going to collapse, it will go to the right, not the left. That's where the power structure is. But oddly enough, this system, in my view, in 1929, government was 11 percent of the economy. That was the floor. It's now 32 to 34 percent. It's not going to collapse. It may decay. It may have recession. It may, all of which create disillusionment and the possibility of serious organizing. So I think our movement is going to grow. And then the question, and I think it's going to expand, and I think we have the chance of transformation, of building a different system. That's a big deal. We're now working in communities. We're not changing the system. We're laying groundwork for changing the system. But that's a very different set of questions. And what has, what's happening now is powerful, in, both in its economic, but particularly in its cultural and social and value formation. So big deal. I think it's really hard to get that, that we are revolutionaries in a system that may actually be taken over and transformed. It's a, existentially. When you look in the, mirror, in the mirror in the morning, are you actually doing that? Are we, and that's, I think, what's happening. So it's a, I think one has to grasp that existentially as an identity, not doing just projects. The second thing that I, I want to suggest is um, I think we're going to have to deal with larger scale institutions. I don't think there's an escape from that. So for instance, I mean, and let me just put it in a couple of ways. Mondrag Mondragon, for all of its value, was 4% of the labor force in the Basque region. Co-ops in Spain were 1.3%, last I checked, of the labor force. And Mondragon, Fagor, the, the company that, that Esteban was talking about, went down because it wasn't, there was no planned economy. The economy collapsed and their market collapsed. So if you depend upon the overall market in some way that's not managed and planned in support, you can go boom, right down. And a lot of them, people were not re-employed, particularly the people who were hired in different countries by Mondragon. I'm a Mondragon fan, but we need to acknowledge and understand that. There would be a necessity of somehow keeping the whole ship afloat in a system. That's what a system's about, not just projects, not just communities, but how it relates one to the other. We haven't gotten that far yet, but we will have to get that far. For instance, in the Evergreen model, where, where you've got several co-ops, they set up a large-scale laundry, worker-owned laundry, to supply particularly for the hospitals and universities. They displaced another laundry, someplace else where workers were lost. That is inevitable to the extent we're successful in building and displacing. So there's a problem about how we deal with that, how we deal with what economists sometimes call the coordination problem between communities as you get to scale. We're not at scale yet. We're not seeing that. We aren't displacing many other people because we're doing something. We're building a new economy. But or take the question of how many came here in an airplane or how many came in a train or how many used satellite technology in their computers, bouncing things. How do you deal with large scale things beyond one community? How is that done? Those are planning system problems that may reflect the values that are developed in the communities, but they take us to much harder questions than we have yet grasped or faced in terms of systemic design. So I, I want to open that dimension of what you do in, a, in the United States and many other countries different. We're living in a continental system, 330 million people, 3,000 miles across diagonally. How do we actually conceive of participatory democracy in such a system? What does it actually look like when we get beyond the community level? How do we think ourselves into these questions that will not go away? Large-scale industry, planning so communities don't go down when another one grows another industry and become self-sufficient but deprives you of your market? How do we begin controlling the power structure of that system? 
So for instance, Esteban was talking about Cuba, which I, I think is what's happening in Cuba is marvelous. But even the most advanced, I think last night the estimate was that a third of the, com of the socialized industries will be made into co-ops. The rest that the socialists will keep as a state. And he was def defending that and supporting that. I don't know if that's the right balance, but within that vision was the notion that larger scale things would have to be controlled somehow in a larger way, hopefully reflecting the values that are being developed in the solidarity economy around, but not ignoring the issue of scale. What do we do with big stuff? And if we don't think that through and allow it to be incorporated in our own thinking even now and begin projecting and a model that actually is, a, the Catholic Church has a great fr way of thinking about this. They're the line, I can't remember the term they use, but it's do whatever you can at the bottom until you're at the place where you need to go up a scale. And only go up subsidiarity. Only go up if you have to, but don't avoid going up when you need to. And I think we're not yet quite grasping that set of questions. It comes up with large-scale industry. Who's going to build your airplanes? Or maybe you don't want airplanes, big ones. Uh, who's going, there are only two manufacturers of global airplanes in the world and because it's such, a big, it's such a hard thing to do right. Uh, what, how do you do, deal with the displacement problem? One community down because its market disappears, another one up. Uh, look at the Rust Belt. I've, I've worked, I started working, on work, as you know, in worker, probably you guys know, I worked in worker co-ops with the steel workers in Youngstown, Ohio in 1977. That city has gone down from 140,000 to 30,000. Why? The market disappeared. Cleveland's gone from 900,000 to less than 400,000. Why? Because nobody's dealing with the stability problem. Detroit has gone a million people down. We can build up, but we're going to need to deal with the so-called coordination issues and thinking through some form of planning, participatory planning, new way of thinking about larger scale. I don't think we're there yet, though I think we can begin to ask ourselves to think those thoughts. Sometimes I think the danger is that we become so oriented to the local, I'm oriented to the local, that we can't do this. It seems foreign. And I think the question of genuine system change, really, you know, dead serious because the opposition is going to come down heavy and hard as scale begins to develop. They'll let us do this for a long while, piddle on the side, they think. As scale begins to develop, these questions are going to be really big questions about the big stuff. So for instance, and these possibilities may happen very quickly, the last economic crisis we nationalized General Motors. Notice, capital system, we actually nationalized General Motors and Chrysler and AIG, the largest insurance company in the world, biggest insurance companies are not insurance interested in insuring you, they're interested in getting your capital. That's like, they're the largest concentration of capital to reinvest when you pay in your money. It's like a big, 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 big bank. They call it an insurance company. They, they were nationalized because of the crisis. We had no idea of what to do with them. There was nobody on the left who had any thought of, I mean, people wrote articles. I wrote articles, we should take over General Motors and Chrysler and turn them into mass transit development systems and make them into worker, worker community control. But we didn't actually have a plan to do that. We don't actually have a plan of what you do about the five big banks. Bernie, this is the level of where we are now. Bernie argued we should break up the big banks. What we know is that from AT&T and Standard Oil, where we broke up the big oil companies and broke up the big telecommunications companies, they regrouped and concentrated again in five minutes. And so the next stage is obviously nationalization and then decentralization to public banks at the community level, at the state level. You all know about Santa Fe and Philadelphia on the verge of setting up city banks. So there's a process, but also there's a scale issue. So what I'm kind of trying to suggest to you, and I, I could probably bore you endlessly because I worry about these problems endlessly, I think we have a shot of transforming the whole system. It's a brutal question because we have not yet gotten anywhere near the power levels that will require them to respond. But the, to be sophisticated, I think our movement is going to have to develop on the basis of the projects, on the basis of the values 
and on the basis of really, really thinking through community-wide structures as well as projects, and then beginning to debate and discuss is really hard. How do we actually lay down the, let me say it carefully, lay down the foundations in practice and in culture and in ideas to actually establish the next system in its largest as well as its smallest scale, all the way. How do we do that? I don't think that's impossible. I think we have a shot of actually doing that, but I think it's a huge, huge confront. I don't think most people see themselves actually as actually transforming the most powerful corporate capitalist system in the history of the world. I think we see ourselves as building power and building projects, critical. But that's going to take us to these larger, very difficult questions of how you actually would manage a system democratically. Some of the issues that come up, for instance, in, in a continental system, extraordinary, 330 million people. Our decentralization, really. So for instance, regions like New England, for instance, or more, or more easy to handle the state of California, which is a gigantic region, could be a semi, a socialist economy, if you like, and radically decentralized within and could relate to the other parts of the New England. I think, what, I think the most interesting thing that may happen over the next 30 years is New England is developing, California is developing. It's the only place you're really getting real action because there's a different politics and the one to watch will be Texas as Hispanics begin to develop majorities, because that's also a very large scale region. And if those three began to move as a regional level, like almost like nation states within the United States, if that movement began and was based on a solidarity vision from the bottom up, you're talking about actually thinking through what a system scale operation might look like in the United States. So that's really an intriguing possibility. But look at California the way it, which is developing very different from the rest of the country. It's the only place where they're doing high-speed rail, for instance, and the de development on the environment is better in most areas and not all areas than the other parts of the country. Lots of interesting things there. Why that region is developing is a whole piece of the puzzle about building the solidarity economy to the next stage. So let me back off of this. I'm getting, how's my time? Almost done. So uh, I think, if those of you who, who are Marxists in the, in the room um, may remember that one of Marx's last statements in, in the Netherlands, one of his big speeches was, most parts of the Marxist analysis is going to be a big collapse and there'll be a revolution. Not everywhere he advised. He thought the United States, Britain, and maybe the Netherlands might go through a different process of transformation. So he opened that door for the, for the Marxists in, in the group. But I think that analysis may be right, that it's something different from reform. Reform means you allow the corporations to run the game if they allow you social security, welfare, some programs on the side, and you, environmental regulation. That's a reform system, and you allow them to expand and control imperial structures around the world. Don't bother us around the world, we'll give you a little more. That's the way in which liberalism and social democracy ran the game. But reforming it was to, you know, civil rights movement. That was a very big advance, huge advance. And some of the environmental regulations are still a huge advance. But they don't, they don't let you go too far, and they certainly aren't going to let you go very far now. The other was collapse and revolution. That's the other big process. The whole thing goes down and you take it over, and usually that means so much violence that you have to set up a state that is almost totalitarian. We have the chance, I think, just possibly, of building a, what I, the term I use is evolutionary reconstruction, changing the institutions piece by piece by piece, changing the culture, and then developing a pathway that actually gets us community first, community second, community third, but then to scale and to scale and beginning now, even now to introduce those ideas of both a long trajectory and the kinds of issues that come up when you go to scale and planning and, this, and the questions of large industry and the coordination difficulty of community after community displacing each other, getting all that on in, and the regional scale to deal with large, larger scale issues still, environmental and others. So I think, I think 
you know, I say this, I, I, say, I say this as a historian, and people look at me. I say, I think this is the most interesting and important period in American history, including the Civil, the Civil War and the Revolution itself. I think they ran the system in the 19th century by killing natives, slavery, and taking over the continent. Every time they got in trouble, they went west. I think they ran the system in the 20th century. Every time they went into trouble, I don't think they planned it this way. I think this happened. The system collapsed in the first quarter of the century and World War I bailed it out. It collapsed in the second quarter of the century and World War II bailed it out. In the third quarter of the century, Korea, Vietnam, massive Cold War. The fourth quarter of the century, military spending is very large but it is declining as a percentage of the economy. It's only in the four to five percent range and it's not a bailout structure. So I think we're living in a period where they, are run, they have run out of options. They're very dangerous. The issues are very large, but I think we just possibly, and I'll say it carefully, have the possibility of establishing the irreversible foundations. I didn't say we get to Jerusalem tomorrow the irreversible foundations of a fundamental systemic transformation that goes beyond community by community. So I think it is an extraordinary time, and the work that's being done here is a fantastic start, start for that work. Thank you very much. So thank you, Gar. These were really fascinating uh, expositions, and the prompt, the aspiration of the prompt, you know, is system change possible, was to do exactly this, to kind of clarify each of our theories of change. Um, and what, despite a lot of the differences, what I noticed w in terms of a kind of a, a convergence here was that principle of evolutionary, emergent, displacing processes that set that groundwork for an eventual uh, change in the system. And this is actually quite distinct from, as you mentioned toward the end of your presentation, a classical Marxian uh, approach of perhaps seizing state power or some of the other kinds of theories of change. Um, so before I allow all of you, we, we just have a few minutes left and I'd like, I know you were all uh, taking notes and I'd like you to kind of present your own uh, uh, reactions and, and uh, feedback to the other presenters. I'd like to leave you with one other question if you choose to answer it. Within that gradualist uh, phase of our theory of change for system change, um, can that accelerate in that process to the point in which we can actually address uh, the tipping points of climate change within the very harsh timeline that's not set by political considerations, but by the physical chemistry of the planet. And if we're not dealing with that in the next roughly two decades and making serious inroads within the existing infrastructure that we have at our disposal through the politics that exist as such, how do we live in a system changed kind of society and economy in a two degree or a three degree or a six degree planet? Um, I think that rich white people are gonna be just fine. Um, I think that planets are giant and the planet will be fine. I think that ecological systems are gonna collapse and I think poor people, brown people are gonna be screwed. Um, so that's part of why when we talk about this work, it's not, it's not, um, it's not reductionist, that we really are talking about collective liberation to kind of lift up and synthesize some of what Julia was saying. Um, and I think that in our indictments of capitalism, to the extent that we have it, we actually haven't gone real hard on capitalism, we just sort of took that as for granted, um, that, that it needs to be twinned with an indictment of racism um, because of our understanding of that they were born in the same moment, <laughs> that they have everything to do with one another. And, um, and in fact, Ta-Nehisi Coates says, uh, somewhere in his book, I just remembered this, I didn't actually write the, the, the quote, but that racism is not the child of race, but rather the father. So we had racism first, 
And that's how we got race. Um, and that's how we get capitalism. It's division, it's separation, right? So it's, it's, a, it's a racialized form of class um, is what race even is. And so on the climate change question, it's about resilience, it's about who gets to endure and survive. It is not the lowland, poor nations, cities, people. Um, I think what's interesting about the US context is that we have this fantastically uh, intriguing mixture of people, which is not true for most nation states. They're not multiracial, um, and they're not as geographically diverse as what we're dealing here. So we're gonna be dealing with a New Orleans that gets flooded over and over and over again. We're gonna be dealing with a Southern Florida that gets battered by hurricanes um, in the same country that has a, a, an Iowa that is nowhere near um, those sort of problems. So that that, I don't know, um, begs its own kind of questions of, of what, are, what are the, what's the fallout of um, the political crisis that's triggered by climate crisis within a semi-coherent nation state. Um, so yeah, some of that stuff I don't know. I think that it's, I wanna lift up part of what, what Gar said also um, in this question, I think it's, it's really astute that, um, that under collapse, whether it's ecological, economic, or otherwise political, um, under collapse, it, that, it, that it won't go to the left. I suspect you're actually right, um, that, that it'll go to the right. And so I think that the urgency isn't um, how bad capitalism is. I think that's getting it wrong. I think the urgency is how underprepared we are for the stakes of the fact that climate, political, or economic crises are gonna push things toward the right because we're, we don't have our act together at scale, um, that we're not ready for the flood of, um, of interest and investment and inquiry for everyday people to be on our side. We're like vastly underprepared for that, um, culturally as well as institutionally. So that's the work we have to do. Again, it's not grappling with capitalism, even though we are grappling with the crises that it's pushing forward. Was that? Great. Um, okay. A few things. One is, my last slide that I forgot to show is spread the word. Just giving people the vision and letting them understand that they are in the midst of this process and that every they, everything they can do can either be constructing the inequality paradigm or it can be constructing the solidarity paradigm. It's, and it's not rocket science. It's actually quite obvious when you have it. It's just that we've had the wool pull, pulled over our eyes by mass media, by econ economists, etc. So spread that word and let people realize that there, they, there is meaning in what they do. They can make a difference. I mean, it sounds trite, but it's, it's real. People can do that. And um, when things get hard, I think one of the things is distraction. What the system tries to do is distract us, distract us by all kinds of you know, entertainment, quote unquote, but also by all kinds of crises everywhere. So it's really hard, but we have to stay calm and remember what we're working on and do our work. And also emotionally, that's why I'm talking about spiritual um, centering. It's extremely hard for those of us because the problem is a lot of people don't want to see the problems in capitalism and that's the strategy and that's what the system wants you to do. They want us to ignore it and just drug ourselves up and drink and party and, and you know, as the ship is, shi as the sip is, sink ship is sinking. <laughs> so anyways, not to be distracted, keep centered, take care of ourselves and look at what's happening and also, of course, very important, do not let them divide us. Divide and conquer is the oldest, oldest, oldest strategy from the ruling class. And that's what they do. They, they, you know, who knows? I was surprised the person who killed those policemen wasn't a black person that was probably an agent or someone who was, you know, hypnotized and made to do that. I mean, they, these kind of things have happened historically. They put people, they create situations, they lead you into violence, they'll take someone who's black and have them kill a white policeman and then say, look, you know, and then try to get that white black tension going. They call it dog whistle politics where they, you know, put in that black rapist for Dukakis and he couldn't win president because it was a black rapist and the white guys just all was stupid and voted for some, you know, totally against their class interests. So we have to remember that and we have to fight that and that's why our work against racism, classism and sexism are so important because then we can, we can feel that bond we know that those, those people are not bad. We know to, to have that mistrust of authority. Question authority, question authority, question authority, question authority. That's so important. And then I love Gar's point. We have to plan ahead. We have to be ready. We have to be serious. We could be winning. This, is, this could change quickly. We have such a quick, with the internet, with the technology, things can change. 
like that. Look at Bernie Sanders. Nobody thought that was going to happen. Nobody, nobody, not even us. Did any of us think we would? Nobody thought he'd get so far. He almost got the nomination. So look at that happening. And it was a totally rigged Democratic Party, and he still almost won. So we have to be ready, and Gar's so right, and we have the computers now. We had economists years ago saying you could have socialism if you could plan the prices. You could figure the supply, you could figure the demand, you could figure the right prices. The Soviet Union was doing it without computers. And they, had the, they were a superpower. They went from a feudal agricultural economy to a superpower using planning. So planning can work. You want to make sure it's democratic. You want to make sure there's a lot of innovation. But wow, with computers, we can do that. They've got Michael Albert's Pericom thing. They've thought about it. We need to go further, 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 and push those and be ready. And be then experimenting. It can be in a, in a locality we're doing it. We're getting our city banks. We're getting our state banks. Get a locality, start doing this planning, start using computers, try to you know, model the economy, and then Gar be ready. We'll all be ready with you <laughs> to have our plan for what to do when they ask you and say, yes, we have an idea for that. And yes, we've thought of that. So let's do it. Yeah, dare to win. I, I actually think, and so, as may be obvious, I think we have a very good shot, shot at winning. And I don't think a lot of people actually do that. So I, I invite you to consider we might actually win. I think we have a very good shot. And that means dealing with all these inter-questions, moving to scale in your minds. So that's, that's one thing. I want to I address the climate change question um, just briefly. I think that it is true we're going, we're almost certainly on the current path, we're going to run into the much more than two degrees or three degrees. And, and the, the, I was in Denmark recently. They're planning to do what the Netherlands has done, build dikes. <clears throat> that, I think, is part of the reality we're facing. As hard as we fight it, we must fight it. But I think the deadline thing gets people crazy. If we don't do it by X, the world will fall apart. The world is going to get worse on climate change. The question is how fast we can develop. And here's my measure and why it's so urgent in another sense. 500,000, it's estimated that 500,000 people a year already die from one or another of the effects of climate change. Anything you do now can save hundreds of lives. Anything. So the more we can do, I'd like to get out of this, if we don't do it by the end of the century, we're in trouble. That, that thing sets a, no. We've got to keep going as hard and as fast as we can. And by the way, it's like stopping a war in which people are dying by the hundreds of thousands every year now. So that process, I think, is, I mean, we've got to think of it, I think, that way. And it goes along with the other process. It's an evolving, let's build and build and build and build over time. And, you know, then we'll deal with the power question, see if those guys win. I think we've got a good shot. That we have the shot to win. And I think, let's just build it. I'm, I'm reasonably confident there'll be a hell of a repression, but they haven't got all the cards. We've got a lot of them building up now, and I think more later. So. All right, everyone. Well, really fascinating conversation. Thank you to the, my panelists here. Uh, it was a terrific uh, uh, conversation and one that uh, I felt was actually very needed at this conference. I thought that this was really edifying for me personally. Um, so uh, unfortunately, we are out of time. I ended up uh, giving everyone a little bit more space for their own individual presentations. It's uh, bled over. So unfortunately, you know, the the um, auditorium dialogue, uh, we're going to have to cut that short um, because we are already over time. But uh, thank you all so much, and uh, feel free to connect with me or any of the panelists after, uh, afterwards, and uh, we can speak offline. Thank you. <laughs>